So, and by the way, the, the priests were the ones who discovered that when they went into the sacrifice of incense, like Zechariah was doing when Gabriel came to him. So the priests were the first ones to see that the, the division was gone. But we're told in the book of Acts that not a few of the priests believed. It was because they worked regularly with the sacrifice, the routines God had established in Leviticus for the, the worship, all of which pointed to the sacrifice of Jesus. So the priests actually were able to perceive how Jesus fulfilled the enactment they were carrying out in a series of routines. So, the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple was necessary also for the people of God. Uh, Acts chapter um, 8 and 9, we hear about the killing of Stephen. Um, and uh, when that happened, generally speaking, 35 AD, it was a the Jerusalem believers were scattered abroad. So they went up and started worshiping, filling the, the good news about Jesus in the communities outside Jerusalem. And when they did that, they began to share how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament promises. And most of the first believers, obviously, were from the community of Israelites. In the synagogues, the various villages where Jesus had visited and done miracles. And so the Christians from Jerusalem, remember it started off with 120 and then 3,000 added on Pentecost and daily the Lord added more. And then they weren't going out and filling the world with the good news. And so God, like the Tower of Babel when they were supposed to scatter and fill everything, he sent down the confusion of tongues to scatter people out. What God did then was he allowed Stephen to be persecuted stoned to death, and a general persecution breaking out. Including the killing of James, the greater, or the apostle James, who walked about with Jesus. His real name, by the way, is Jacob, just in case you know. Uh, when I served in Illinois, there was a member of the congregation there, his last name was Jacob. And a bunch of those hanging out around, you know, Greenalt and, and uh, Prairie to Rocher and out in the neck of the woods. For those of you who are familiar with Southern Illinois, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Southern Illinois, those folks are still hanging out there. But that's just right across the river north of us. So straight north, across the river, and you get in that general area up there, north of Chester, that's where the Jacobs family comes from. The name for the apostle of our Lord who was killed by Herod and beheaded was Jacob, not James. He was called him James for years, his name is Jacob. Okay? Um, and so the author of this epistle that we're going to take a look at now is also Jacob. But he's not the same guy that Herod killed. He's after the stoning of Stephen. This, this uh, epistle was most likely written around the year 45. It was between 35 and 50. Okay? It's probably probably the earliest written New Testament book. It definitely is the earliest written epistle. The Gospels might have been written before this, but the epistle of James is unique in this, that it's written to people of God who are part of the dispersion who are Hebrews. Let me put that another way. There aren't any Gentile congregations to write to yet. Okay? The Gentiles in, in Caesarea and in Antioch in Syria, those were the ones who first called the followers of Jesus Christians. But Philip and then Peter began sharing the gospel with Gentiles and so they had to bring this question to the council in Jerusalem. How much do you ask Gentiles to do to follow the faith? How many of the rules do you have to follow from the Old Covenant? So in the early Christian church, all of the people connected to the early church were people who came out of the Old Covenant teaching. Circumcision, dietary laws, no work on the Sabbath, don't wear clothing of two different types of cloth, um, you know, restrictions as far as 
how far you can walk on the Sabbath. All those things were thought, stuff they'd been taught as children growing up and learning. You know, it's sort of like, on one hand, similar to, and on another hand, not quite the same thing as your mother telling you you need to wash your hands before you eat. Remember that? Ever heard lately somebody said your mother was right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> but this idea that there were certain routines and rituals that everybody followed. So if we look at the epistle of James, or Jacob, we're looking at a time when most of the Christians, not all, but most of the Christians grew up in a Israelite Hebrew community. Okay? Remember, when Paul starts writing, he's writing to the Gentile communities where God sent him. But when Jacob, James, writes his epistle, he's writing to scattered Hebrews who left Jerusalem because of persecution. And what did Jesus say? Go and make disciples of all nations. And the typical behavior pattern of most Christian congregations is... We're happy with those who hang around with us and look like us, but we're not going to go find anybody else. If they want to come and join us, that's fine, but we're not going to go find them. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Why should we go anywhere? Let them come to us. Yeah. And for whatever it's worth to you, uh, it's interesting how God uses persecution through the history of the world to get his word to spread. Because... A good number of my ancestors, some of yours too, left the countries they were in because the government was not allowing them to worship God according to their conscience, or was imposing on them restrictions about how they had to worship, or was prohibiting them from teaching their children the faith they believed. And so God used persecution to get them to go somewhere else where they then started telling more people the good news. So, in the history of the church, you ready for the tough question? Is persecution a good thing or a bad thing? And the answer is yes. Okay? In the history of the church, persecution is a good thing and a bad thing. It's harmful personally. It's, it's difficult for especially those who are new in the faith or young in the faith. But persecution also causes people to begin to express the faith clearly and directly in ways that otherwise they might not. Or to quote the old phrase you may have heard somewhere along the line, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. What is someone willing to die for? If they're willing to die for it, it's important to them, right? And if you're willing to die for it, people sometimes want to find out what you're willing to die for. But if you're dying for it without saying bad things about the people killing you, and you're praying for those who are harming you to be brought to Jesus as believers, and if you're refusing to condemn those who are attacking you, but instead you're praying for them, you'll probably get attention from people who say, why in the world would you act like that? Okay. Now, here's the challenge. You and I were raised in certain environmental conditions by our family and our community that have influenced the way we see the world. We don't recognize that most of the time. Okay. How many of you grew up either on a farm or in a rural community? Put your hand up. Okay. How many of you grew up in a metropolitan community of more than 100,000? Yeah, explains a lot about you, Bill. Um, <laughs> you see I, the other? I moved a lot. I you moved a lot too. But but the the realization that you can't walk three blocks down the street to get something you need, you have to drive twenty miles to get something you need, influences the way you look at what you really need. Now, just you understand that, what you just told me is that a bunch of Lutheran members of this congregation are much more accustomed to not getting something, doing without, and not driving out of their way to get something, so that if there's something that needs to be done, most of us share the mindset that says, well, we don't have to do that now, it can wait. 
And when Jesus comes back and asks, what have we done? Will we say, well, we thought it could wait. Every once in a while you've got to step back from yourself and say, what am I not seeing? What do I not see because of how I was raised? The epistle of James addresses that issue. For people who were raised in a certain mindset and taught certain things. You remember Jesus and his disciples walking out of the temple? Gospel of John. And as they're walking out of the temple, sitting beside the door begging is a blind man. Remember? Remember this story? Gospel of John. The man's been begging for years. And as they come out of the door, the disciples ask Jesus a simple question. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? What does that tell you? A mindset that says, if you're suffering, God is punishing you. If things are going well, God is blessing you. Therefore, who should you pay attention to and want to give spe special preferential treatment to? Let's read the Epistle of James. Okay. Uh, besides a prayer of thanks for Bill and Brandy's little girl, and, and I know, Jim, you told me what the name was. Was it Eliza Rose or? Judith K. K. Judith K. Judith K. I thank you. I'd forgotten what it was and I couldn't remember. So we're going to have a prayer of thanksgiving for her safe delivery and also continued protection. Any other prayer requests before I go further into James? Seeing no hands, head movement, or indications of desires for prayer, we'll go ahead and start with prayer. Good and gracious God, we thank you for opening our eyes by the Holy Spirit. You've enlightened us with your gifts that we might truly see Jesus as our Savior, as our Lord, and as the one who calls us to walk in his steps. We give thanks for your many blessings to us each day, for breath, and water, and food, for strength to move and Ability to reason and perceive the world around us. We thank you for medical care and gifts of healing and protection and surgery. We especially give thanks to you for the gift of a healthy baby girl, Judith K., born to Bill and Brandy Green. We ask you to be both with Judith and with Brandy as recovery and growth continue. Watch over and protect this little one. Use the medical staff attending her give her a chance to grow and continue to develop as you intend. Watch over and protect all of us by your holy angel. You especially give us joy in receiving new life, physically in the birth of a child, spiritually in the life of your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. As we take a look at James, I'm just going to start by opening up your, your Bibles that you didn't bring. I was under the impression we had a big book rack full of Bibles at one time. Am I mistaken? We do. Is it in one of these closets here somewhere? It's probably locked. See if we can grab it and pull it out. Lutherans are notorious, by the way, for doing what we're doing. Coming to Bible study without a Bible. Um, now, some, some Christian communities, everybody brings their Bible into church for the, the worship service. And that's because in many Christian communities, the Sunday morning service is actually a type of, of Bible study sermon. Where the, you know, as Lutherans, we tend to run a little different direction with that, in that we use a textually based sermon that deals with the, the topic in a text, rather than finding everything in the Bible that deals with that one topic and looking at all those different verses. Which isn't the wrong thing to do, but that's not a sermon. It's a study, okay? It's a commentary on our behavior patterns. If you grew up as a Lutheran, you're used to this. Come to, come to the worship service, you don't need your Bible. If you grew up in another denomination, you might be used to the idea you come to worship and you bring the Bible with you. And you don't remember that it's your environment that taught you that. You think this is what every Christian does. 
and wrong again. The fish is the last one to notice the water in the aquarium. Really, seriously. So, we, we seem to have, have mislocated well, our bodies. They were removed because of COVID concerns. Yeah, I, I, I know that we're not going to. Yeah, know. thank you. The idea was very simple. You pick one up, you take it home with you, you All bring right, it back next week. We'll see if we can work that out. But that's fine. Well, I'll read it out loud to you, and then a couple people have their Bibles with you, and I'll ask you to read as well, okay? James, or Jacob, begins with a very simple statement. James, of God and Jesus, our Lord the Christ, a servant. And, and as we looked at it in English, it says, Jacob, or James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. The twelve tribes in the dispersion status. Okay? And as, as he uses this phrase, the way he actually says it in Greek, it makes the focus not on him, but on who he serves. It's James, of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, a servant. Notice the issue is not his status, it's the one he serves. The Greek word order is important, and when we translate it into English, we often try to turn it into an English phrase, which is what translation is. Nothing wrong with it. But the Greek word order tells us that the focus in the very introduction of the letter is not on James. It's on the God, Jesus Christ, who is Lord, whom he serves. And then he says, to the twelve tribes in the diaspora. Have you ever heard that word before? It's the Greek word that means scattered about. Every once in a while, in the spring of the year, I go out in the woods, and I frustrate myself looking for morels. I find a few, and I frustrate myself. How do morels propagate? Diaspora. They scatter spores about. The seed which will produce the next generation puffs out from, is scattered out from the mushroom itself. You think just maybe the Greek word tells us something about planting the church? The seed is now sent out to where the growth needs to take place, the diaspora. There are reasons for you to learn Greek. The reasons are for the Holy Spirit to deepen your understanding of Scripture. And for you to be able to say when somebody tells you, this is what the Bible says, yeah, I don't think you quite got that word right. Okay? Simple example is the phrase that Jesus says, the one who has departed from us, whom the heavens must, and the King James translation says, whom the heavens must contain. But the Greek word is not contain. The Greek word is received. Now, is Jesus received into heaven or is he contained in heaven? If something's contained, guess what? It can't get out. If something is received, it simply is taken in because it's already there. You can't push it away because you can't receive it. Well, does it matter whether Jesus is received in heaven or contained in heaven? Yeah, if you're going to say Jesus can't be present everywhere, because the, the Bible says he must be contained in heaven. You see the problem with translations? If you don't really translate it right, you mislead people. The diaspora, the spores scattered around. And then the simple Greek word of greetings, tyrant which is just kind of a way of saying blessing or good things to you. Greetings, Tyrant. Okay? The 12 tribes. 
Real quick review. We did this timeline of history. How many tribes of Israel were in the, the northern kingdom called Israel? How many tribes in the north? And how many tribes in the south called Judah? Seven and five. Seven and five. Not quite. Ten and two. Ten in the north, two in the south. Benjamin and Judah. By the way, Jerusalem is in the tribe of Benjamin territory, and the three kings of the United Kingdom, Saul, David, and Solomon, come from Benjamin and Judah. So the kingdom of, of David includes Jerusalem and Saul's territory. And then what we're told is the ten northern tribes follow false gods. But James or Jacob is saying all twelve are back. All 12 tribes are included. Even if you can't prove your ancestry by a pedigree, 12 tribes are included. Okay? So it's all the people of God who are scattered abroad. But he's writing to the people who were out of a Hebrew or Israelite background, not to Gentiles. All right? Were any of you here members who attended worship when the congregation still worshiped across the road? Any of those people here? Okay. Do you recall communion services when you were a young child? Did the men sit on one side and the women on the other? I don't remember that. You don't remember that? Okay. Yeah, the, some congregations did that in, into the 70s. And... It was a custom that was handed down for reasons that have never been explained to me. <laughs> and I've asked people the reason, and no one was ever able to tell me. Now, that doesn't mean it's a bad custom. It means it's lost its meaning if you don't know why you do it. There were customs and practices in the early church, and some of those came out of the synagogue. And so what James is doing, he's addressing the need for the people who came out of that culture to stop and say, wait a minute, is this what Jesus gave to his disciples, or is this something we brought in from our own background that doesn't apply anymore? Okay? We're going to take a look at that thought. All right? James, a servant of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what you don't find here is the word brother of the Lord. Okay? So when we talk about James, the brother of the Lord, uh, it's a term that's used in the New Testament. And as we look at the book of Acts, we're told that James, the brother of the Lord, was one of the early Christian leaders. And this is this guy. Book of Acts. Who was gathered in the upper room? After Jesus ascended, before the Holy Spirit poured out, Acts chapter 1. 120 people, including the women, Mary, the mother of our Lord, and James, the brother of our Lord. What does it not say? Mary, the mother of our Lord, and James, the son of Mary, the brother of our Lord. In fact, the Greek construction there uses the article that's in the genitive form. The mother of our Lord and the brother of our Lord. Both of them are called something. Mary is called of our Lord the mother and James is called or Jacob is called of our Lord the brother. The preposition of is not applied to both of them at the same time. And so when we look at Acts chapter 1, verse 18, I think it is, we hear that as they're choosing, no, 24, it doesn't matter. It's in, it's in the account of the, uh, the disciples picking the replacement for Judas. And what we're told there is that Mary is the mother of our Lord, and she has her own article, definite article in the genitive form, the mother of. And James has his own definite article, the brother of which says they're not from the same family. If you wanted to identify James as being the biological son of Mary, you would include 
Mary, the mother of our Lord, and James, his brother. And they'd have been the same phrase, but they're not. They're separate phrases. So when we go back to the, the, the Greek New Testament, it does tell us things that in the Greek you can find, and in the English you may not figure out. So when it says the brother of our Lord, it does not mean he is Mary's son. But he is Jesus' brother. Now, if you want to spend a lot of time worrying about that, I urge you not to do it. <laughs> because it will not change anything in Scripture for you. It will not change what Jesus did for us. It will not change your relationship or my relationship with God. Okay? And Scripture warns us not to spend time with meaningless genealogies. <laughs> Just in case you missed it. The Bible tells you not to waste time with meaningless, meaningless, meaningless genealogies. The ancestry of Jesus is not a meaningless one. The ancestry of Mary is meaningless. The ancestry of Jacob or James, the brother of our Lord, is meaningless. The point is not their ancestry. It's their relationship with Jesus. That's what counts. Okay? So, as we look at this, we start with that very simple reality. James is the brother of our Lord in Jerusalem, a leader of the church. And the other thing we notice is the sequence of these books in the New Testament. First is the Gospels and the Acts, then Paul's epistles as a group, ending with his specific epistles to Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Then we have a general epistle, no offer given, to the Hebrews, again, early church, before the destruction of the temple. And the very next book in sequence is the books, the short epistles named after the apostles or the leaders of the church who wrote them. Who are they? James, Peter, John. What order did the early church put these in? James was first. And when the church met in, in Jerusalem for a council, Acts chapter 15, who is the leader of the church who speaks on behalf of the whole people? It's not Peter. It's this guy, James. Okay? So the early church said James was a big deal. After he died, of course, others took over. All right, so what we have here? Count it all joy, my brothers, verse 2, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Back to the question I asked earlier. Is persecution a good thing or a bad thing? Yes. Count it all joy, brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Count it all joy. Why can we do that? How can we do that? Remember what I said earlier? The early Christian community coming out of Hebrew background would have thought a person suffering some kind of difficulty, persecution, trial, physical health, who sinned, this man or his parents who was born blind. Did you think that those people on the, the Tower and Siloam fell were great sinners and all the other people? Or those people that Herod killed were worse sinners than the rest? Remember Jesus asking that question? And his statement as he asked that question is, do you think they were worse sinners because A, Herod killed them, and B, the tower fell on them? And do you know what the answer would have been if they'd have answered Jesus? They would have said, yes, of course they were worse sinners. That's why it happened to them. And Jesus says, I tell you, no. How does he have to tell them no? Why does Jesus have to say no to them? Because they say yes. The same mindset that says, if I'm suffering, God must be mad at me. If things aren't going my way, God must be out to get me. And what James is saying is, count it all joy that you're suffering. All kinds of trials. What does the Apostle Paul say? 
Rejoice. Again, I say to you, rejoice. Count it all joy that you are able to be persecuted on behalf of the name of Christ. Paul and James say exactly the same thing about suffering. Count it joy. Doesn't feel like joy, does it? You need to have the water in your aquarium to change. <laughs> it's time to change the water in your aquarium. It really is. And this is what baptism does. It washes us clean of the old water, the old mindset, the old way of looking at the world. And if anyone is in Christ Jesus, this person is what? A new creation. Do not be conformed to this present world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds through the work of the Holy Spirit. You need to change the water in your aquarium. And you need to quit jumping back into the old aquarium water. And that's tough for us, isn't it? Is God mad at me because things didn't go well? What's my first response? Is my first response always, no, I will celebrate this event? James is just nuts, right? Count it all joy, brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Because the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Or firmness. Trials. Any challenging circumstance that comes into your life. This, by the way, is not the same as, as being tempted. Okay. Temptation to sin is sure to come, Jesus says. But woe to that person through whom the temptation comes. So this isn't the same as, as being tempted by Satan, by your own sinful nature. We don't count temptations as something to rejoice in. Okay? These are trials of different kinds. It's not the same Greek word as temptation. Okay? James does get into temptations later in this epistle, just understand. He'll cover that, so it's there. We're not there yet. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Okay, wait a minute. What does this mean? This testing is going to produce steadfastness and perfect and complete. Perfecto. What's the word perfect mean? Without blemish. That's, that's the, the English uh, definition of perfect, without blame. Yeah. The, the Latin word perfecto actually means through with the process of being done or made or, or finished. The equivalent English word there would be mature. See, when we say perfect, we hear that without blame. And, and this is part of the challenge, because he's talking about God doing a, a purifying process. And he shall purify the sons of Levi with a refiner's fire. Peter talks about this in his epistle. That your faith, which is more valuable than gold, and gold is purified by fire, you're going to go through all kinds of trials so that your faith might prove to be pure, genuine, completed. Same idea as, as Peter's letter here, okay? Perfected, or God is finished with the process, if you can say it that way, okay? So when we say perfect without faults would be a good way to say that, that your faith might now be cleansed of the faults that are part of your sinful human nature. And God keeps purifying our faith and giving us new faith by the work of the Holy Spirit. And elsewhere you might remember Paul writes, not that I've already attained this goal, not that I've reached it, but I strive toward it. And what James is telling us is, let steadfastness, standing firm, have its full effect. That you might 
the complete finished product, lacking in nothing. Or, in no way being deficient. Okay? How many of you have a deficiency in your eyesight? <laughs> yeah, okay. How about in your hearing? Yeah. Well, how do we fix that? It's a really simple answer. We die and Jesus comes back. Or Jesus comes back before we die. That's how we fix it. Jesus comes back. You and I can't fix it. Okay? So we struggle with this understanding of being able to correct things. The disciples asked who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind, and Jesus said, Neither, but that the glory of God might be made known. And then he spit on the ground, and he made some mud, and he put it on the man's eyes, and he says, Go to the pool called Sent. I'm sending you to the Sent place. And wash your eyes. And so the blind man went to the pool. He lived in Jerusalem for years, blind. He knew how to get around. Probably could tell by the smell of certain shops and the sounds of particular buildings and the, you know, the, the feel of the pathway. Maybe he smelled the water if he sensed the humidity changing as he walked because without eyes he paid attention to things you and I ignore most of the time. And he arrived at the pool and he washed in. He could sort of maybe part the sea, but not really. No! His eyes were opened and he saw everything. Because that's what Jesus does. Jesus restores that which sin has broken. He restores our relationship with the Father. He restores our relationship as imperfect people to a holy God. That's what Jesus came to do. And so as the process of God doing that in our lives takes place, James says, hang in there. Let steadfastness have its full effect. Let it work to the end. We call these things something that they actually are not. You know what we call these little things? Cellular telephones. Technically, they're not telephones. They're radio transmitters and receivers. Okay? Because a telephone is the sound at the end of a wire. Because that's what the word tele means, at the end. This is not a telephone. Because it's not at the end of anything. Okay? Let steadfastness have its full effect. Let it work to the end of its purpose. That's what it says here. Full effect means the end of what it's supposed to do. When is Jesus done with you? When he comes and takes you to heaven. In the meantime, let whatever you're going through have its full effect. Let God continue to build you. That's what James is saying here. Then verse 5, a very important verse. If any of you lacks wisdom, ding, 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 that's me, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, who gives generously to all, without reproach, and it will be given him. If you lack wisdom, what has God promised? Ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened unto you. Whose promise is that? Not mine. God's. If you lack wisdom, ask the Lord and he will give it. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. 
And by the way, James is, is a teacher who uses all kinds of analogies and illustrations throughout his, his epistle. How many of you have ever been on a boat on the water? Okay. How many of you have ever been on a boat on some water bigger than a pond or your own creek? Okay. How many of you have ever been on the ocean in a boat? Okay. Have you enjoyed the 40 degree swells? How many of you have ever been in a 40 foot swell? Okay. Let me tell you something. You want to watch the horizon. You want to look at a stable point that doesn't move. Because if you focus on the waves and the wind that splashes the waves around, you're going to get dizzy and seasick, and you're going to be wretched for the next three days. Okay? James has been on a boat. That's why he uses this expression. Now, he may have only been on a boat on the Sea of Galilee, but big storms blow up on that lake. It's big. Okay? And the way it lies in a particular valley, the way the wind comes through and, and moves through the, the Sea of Galilee, it's subject to sudden squalls, as we would call them. Not quite like Lake Superior, but it's, you know, it's bad. And he says, the problem is one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. And as the water comes up and the wind is real strong, guess what happens at the top of that wave? It goes away in spray. It's blown away and is no longer part of the wave it was in. And as you watch the wave come up and the wind is strong, you can literally see the wave being decapitated and the wind blowing the water into spray and the wave is diminished. And this is what James is talking about. He says, ask in faith that God will give you wisdom. Okay? So that person that asks must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord if he is asking in doubt. There's a challenge, asking in doubt. Okay. And then the, the very next verse, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Um, double-minded is an interesting word. It's actually person who is uh, of two minds, if you will. I'm of two minds about that. You know what that means, don't you? It's a split decision. It means there's no answer. A split decision means there's no answer. It's not yes, it's not no. We'll pick this up, God willing, next week. Uh, or about the time to stop. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to, to Visit with each other briefly before we depart. But we'll pick up here, God willing, early ways planned, which rarely happens next week, James chapter 1. Uh, try to bring the Bible with you. We'll try to get some Bibles out. And, you know, and like I said, you pick one of the church's Bibles up, take it home with you, bring it back for Bible study. So don't worry about people passing anything back and forth. But uh, we'll meet together. God's blessings to you. May he grant you his wisdom so that you might indeed walk in his path. Go in the Lord's peace. Thank you.